Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be number two in a short series of videos about the intersection between the hermeneutic element of existential phenomenology and Eastern practices, and more specifically, meditation. Okay, so in the first video in this series, I talked about the structure of hermeneutics, what hermeneutics is basically about. And uh, probably the first theme that I should remind you of is that a hermeneutic interpretive activity is a circular or possibly helical one. And this is the first point of intersection that I'd like to talk about between um, hermeneutics and so-called Eastern thinking. And here I should probably mention that my main point of contact with Eastern thinking is by way of Buddhist thought and my own personal uh, practice of meditation, which I've been doing for, I'm trying to think how long I've been doing it, like uh, 30 years or something like that. It's been a little while at any rate. Um, uh, okay, so uh, for the most part, I'll be looking at this intersection from a Buddhist point of view is what I'm trying to get across. Although I think that uh, probably the point of intersection is much larger than that, as I explained in the last video. Okay, so uh, hermeneutic activity is a circular kind of activity. It has to do with oscillating between two layers of meaning. I explained that in the previous video. Um, well, we find that in uh, Eastern practices, more specifically Buddhist, more specifically yet meditative practices, uh, a big deal of emphasis on circularity too, like just the simple activity of meditation at one level is, um, you know, it's about breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. It's just about that, like the circularity of dwelling with something very simple over and over again. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, and uh, allowing your attention to uh, stay focused on that. And sort of the effect, of course, is to uh, empty yourself of the usual uh, clutter and preoccupations and deflections from the present moment that usually uh, fill and clutter up our awareness. So it's a way of, uh, you know, in Buddhist, uh, parlance, we talk about this in terms of shunyata, okay, which is a word that means emptiness. Okay, so circularly dwelling, breathe in, breathe out. Well, um, in uh, hermeneutics, of course, there's a similar circular activity that has to do with experiencing life, understanding life, experiencing life, understanding life. But the main uh, sort of theme here is that, well, both, uh, both meditative practice and uh, hermeneutics have to do with not just a circular way of uh, understanding or living, uh, but with the thematic of dwelling, that the best kind of understanding comes by way of dwelling at length uh, with something, to see it from many different perspectives and to stay with it over and over and over. So there's a kind of patience, I would say, both in hermeneutic activity and also in meditative practice, you know. And in that regard, they're both very unlike our typical Western way of thinking about what understanding is and what its value is, because our typical un Western way of, un of talking about that has to do with a more or less linear idea about what it is to think about something and what it is to understand something. So our typical Western way is, well, you move from A to B to C until you get to the end of the alphabet and then you're done. Okay, well, so really the, the point of your thinking is to get to Z, usually in the most efficient way possible. And, uh, you know, from the point of view of meditative practice, also from the point of view of something like hermeneutics, uh, well, first of all, there's no destination. I explained that in the last video, that hermeneutics is a non-telic <laughs> way of understanding things. So the point is not to get you to some place definite. The point is to find yourself on the way, on the road of life, and to take the next step. So uh, the value of hermeneutic activity is, is more about deepening and amplifying the process of being alive. Okay, so deepening your life and awakening more and more uh, to your life. Awakening, that's another theme that I would say uh, that the two things have in common. So uh, hermeneutics and existential phenomenology, probably existentialism more generally, is 
ultimately about a kind of awakening to the reality of existence. Well, so too is uh, meditation practice, at least of the type that I engage in. Here's the thing about meditation practice. Maybe I should mention this. There are a lot of different activities that uh, fall under the banner of meditation and some of them are very unlike what I'm trying to describe to you and some of them are much more like what I'm trying to describe to you. So, um, all right, so the emphasis in both is in any case on patient dwelling. You know, it's sort of like, uh, maybe, maybe you've discovered this in regular life, even if you're a Westerner, uh, that you understand books best when you reread them, you know, like you understand movies a lot of the time best when you rewatch them, you know, not just when you rush off to the next damn book or the next damn movie or something like, or video games, same thing in video games. It's like you really enjoy the game, at least I do, the most when I play it a bunch, play through it all the way. Uh, including DLCs all the way to the end a bunch of times and then you know with because each time if it's a good video game you'll appreciate a little bit more the same is true of books the same is true of movies the same is true of life okay you know so uh, this whole paradigm of well you need to rush through things to get to the end well you know maybe that's not the best paradigm for being alive maybe it's not the best paradigm for understanding being alive either either so uh, and I think that uh hermeneutics and meditative experience would both embody that kind of suspicion that the point is to dwell with what is, to circle around the ancient tower. God, I wish I said that. That was the famous German romantic poet Rainer Maria Rilke. Okay, so Rilke, circling around the ancient tower. Um, at any rate, so it's, it's, they're both circular activities and so they both sort of question this whole linear type ethic. All right, so, but here's comes a, here comes a bigger point of linkage between them. So in Buddhist thinking, um, one of the, the central operative principle of all reality has to do with impermanence, okay, that everything changes and everything overcomes itself with time, that we ourselves change throughout the course of our lives. And of course, there's a big change. Uh, well, first, the first big change is simply being born into this world. And then uh, the last big change is exiting this world. So uh, change uh, from this perspective, this Buddhist perspective, pervades all of reality, including the very personal participation we all have in reality. So uh, nothing stays the same, like all of our understandings are going to be eventually washed into the sea. All of our great truths that we think are so damn permanent withstand, you know, the centuries and millennia and eons and so on. That's a complete illusion because <laughs> it's just a matter of time. I think you know this from regular Western scientific cosmology that in approximately, well, the current estimate is about four to five billion years, the sun will go through its normal life cycle and consequently expand out to the point where it actually engulfs the earth. So even if you think, well, the earth will always be there, it's like, no, it won't. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Just you wait around long enough and the earth's going too. So pack your crap, kids. It's all going away. <laughs> pack your stuff, man. We all have to pack our stuff. So here's how I said it in your notes. Uh, another point of linkage has to do with affirming the Heraclitian impermanence of all of our truths, all of which are regarded as a kind of sand mandala. Okay, you probably don't know what that is. So a sand mandala in Buddhist, this is something that derives from Tibetan Buddhist practice. It's a sand mandala is an incredibly ornate um, uh, artistic design, symmetrical usually sort of quadrilaterally symmetrical uh, design uh, made out of individual grains of colored sand. And if you've ever watched monks put together one of these sand mandalas, it takes like weeks to put one of these things together. And it's cre incredibly labor intensive. And they're, at points they're manipulating individual grains of sand with tweezers. It's like almost incomprehensibly um, labor intensive. You know, so what's the point of a sand mandala? Well, the point of a sand mandala is um, to put it together and admire it maybe for a short time and then, uh, then sweep it into the sea. Okay, so the real point is it's a demonstration of this idea of impermanence that, you know, it's a way of sort of letting people know that, hey, this is the game you're really playing. You're playing the game of impermanence. <laughs> in a very personal way, also with respect to the earth, also with respect to all things human, 
everything. All of our understandings, our much vaunted understandings. Uh, I mean, even the truths of science are subject to this when you think about it. It's like, you know, for a long time, well, several centuries, um, the Western world thought that Newtonian mechanics was the ultimate answer to life, the universe, and everything. So equations like F equals MA, that's force equals mass times acceleration, and related questions were the ultimate a uh, mathematical way of describing reality. Well, it turned out a few centuries later that that was not actually the case. That, that was a kind of hubris-driven illusion that we had because a little guy in a <laughs> Swiss patent office decided that he was going to play with the idea that, well, you know, actually um, reality is a matter of perceiving things from certain frames of reference which are always relative to one another. So uh, quantities like uh, mass and time are not the monolithic constructions we normally think they are, but they actually vary with respect to velocity. And when you get close to the speed of light, turns out that mass is not constant. Turns out that time is not constant either. And you may think that this is sort of a wild tale. Actually, this has been known for whatever, a hundred and 20 years almost at this point. Theory of general relativity happened in the early, very early 20th century. So over 100 years for sure. Um, so what's the point? So F equals MA turned out to be another sand mandala. Okay, all the truths of psychology when you think about it, like they're subject to the same sort of impermanence. You know, anything we think is like immutable and solid is actually made of sand and it's being constantly worn down by the endless washing of the waves of life upon the shore of the world. Like <laughs> that's really what's going on. So, you know, like my own accomplishments, whatever, being tenured professor, PhD, etc. That's a sand mandala too. That's going away too. Like everything you value, everything you think is, uh, is immutable and important and uh, rock solid. There is no such thing as rock solid. Even the, the uh, pyramids in Egypt are slowly getting worn away, you know, uh, over time. So, <laughs> our misery, in turn, to continue with sort of the Buddhist um, narrative, is rooted in, the, in our inability to accept that. So what do we do? Well, uh, because it makes us feel insecure to realize how impermanent everything is, including our own existence, we cling to things with a white knuckle death grip. We cling to ideas and like we cling to values and we cling to our sense of what the real is and we cling to this and that. and. Uh, the misery is, of course, the fact that that's a complete illusion. That, you know, everything will be torn from us eventually. All it takes is time. Everything we're holding on to, it's all bubbles, right? Like we're trying to hold on to bubbles all the damn time. And that's the root of our misery. In other words, to put this in more, uh, I guess, sympathetically Buddhist language, the, the root of our misery has to do with our attachment to different ideas, okay? All right, so that's Buddhism. Now, where's the point of linkage to? Hermeneutics. Well, the thing about the hermeneutic circle is um, when you have an insight about life based upon your everyday experience and you think it's, oh, it's so glowing and it's so luminous and it's so powerful and it has utilitarian value too. Well, the thing is about life that the next bit of your life might show you that that insight needs to be altered. It's not quite accurate. Sometimes they need to be retracted or you need to do a complete 180 on your, your supposedly glowing, immutable, luminous insight. You know, it, uh, very often they need to be retooled or they're not quite accurate or they're accurate only in special cases and stuff like that. So, attachment. <laughs> attachment within the hermeneutic circle. The hermeneutic circle is always asking you to hold on to your insights loosely because the next thing life might show you is you're wrong or at least you weren't completely right or it's only true in special cases or something like that. So much like Buddhist thinking, um, hermeneutic type thinking also emphasizes this this motif of attachment. All right. Um, Okay, so uh, they both have this idea of impermanence running through them. They're both circularly structured, and they both have this idea that, dude, you need to hold on to whatever it is you think has value and reality loosely. You need to hold on loosely. Like the old dinosaur band, 38 Special said in the 1970s, and I'll quote them, hold on loosely, don't let it go, you cling too tightly, 
you're going to lose control. Okay, you cling too tightly, man. That's where your misery lies. All of our misery, clinging on to this, that, or the other thing, that's the real deep root of it. Okay, so both of them, and I hope you're getting the sense for how there's a real parallelism there. So, um, okay, everything's a sand mandala from the point of view of both uh, Buddhist thinking, also from the point of view of hermeneutic thinking, in a sense. Uh, well, does that include existentialism, existentialism as a whole? Yeah, it does. Does that include the idea of impermanence? Is the idea of impermanence itself impermanent? Ooh, you get a little bit tricky with that little infinite regress thing now, aren't you? Well, damn, I'm so proud of you. Yes, the idea of impermanence is itself impermanent. And the reason why is because we might not yet have the final formula for what impermanence really is, or the final sense, the final lived sense for it. And in fact, you know, as you, as you continue in meditative practice, one of the things that can happen is you become much more acutely aware of it, how subtle it is and how tricky it is and how pervasive it is for that matter. So the, the sense that you, of impermanence that you went into the thing with <laughs> might need to be retooled as you become more conscious and you uh, broaden the outer uh, horizon of your perceptual field by way of meditative practice, stuff like that. Okay, so everything's a sand mandala, including sand mandalas. <laughs> so it's not quite as easy maybe as you were thinking. Everything's in process. Humanistic psychology, that's in process. Existentialism, that's in process, right? Everything is sliding away from itself. So who you think you are? Oh, who you think you are? To get personal about it, that's going away too as you get older. You know, you deepen that, it needs to get retooled. Sometimes you find out that you've been living illusions for a long time in your life and you need to sort of adopt a whole different pattern every now and then. If you're lucky, you get to go through that. Okay, so um, everything's a sand mandala. It's all going away. So uh, last little bit in your notes has to do with... Uh, the idea of passion, okay, so this seems to be a, a point of divergence between at least Buddhist thinking and uh, existentialism because we saw when we were looking at Kierkegaard this, this fairly ardent insistence on living passionately and, uh, you know, sort of extolling the virtues of the passions and taking up the passionate, committed life, committing to your way of being and living that out with as much passion as you can. And uh, it seems like, well, passion... Uh, in that sense, might be a way of sort of describing attachment and clinging on to things and so on and so forth. So to resolve that seeming tension or paradox, I put in your notes uh, the idea of fallibilism. Okay, so the question is, what is the philosophy of fallibilism about? And fallibilism is a mode of philosophy that emphasizes two things at the same time. And uh, the first of which is sort of embedded in the name, because fallibilism sort of has fallible embedded in the name. And uh, so what does that mean? That means fallibilists recognize that you and I and everyone else uh, can be utterly wrong about everything at any and all points. Uh, Arare humanum est, as we used to say in Latin class, okay, when I was a kid, like, uh, uh, to err is human, okay? All right, so and uh, so fallibilism recognizes the fallibility of everything, all right, and the, um, in a sense, the impermanence of everything, the impermanence of all of our understandings. Why? Because we can be wrong at any and all points, and usually it's just a matter of time until life shows us that we were wrong in one way or another. And the second element of fallibilism is that the fact that you can be wrong, the fact that everything is impermanent, is no reason for you to give up on passionately questing for understandings that matter, asking questions, grappling with reality. The fact that everything is going away is no reason for you to sort of weep and gnash your teeth and get depressed and all of that kind of stuff. In fact, in a way, it's just the opposite. The fact that everything go is going away, the fact that you can be wrong, the fact that you probably are wrong and that life will eventually show you how wrong you are, uh, can be nothing more than the adventure that you're on, the sort of passionate adventure that you're on follows the crooked road of error. <laughs> You know, so what we what we maybe normally think of as well that sucks. You know, like the arara humanum est. That really sucks. Like that we're prone to this fallible type condition. Well, well, who says it has to suck? 
No one's saying that has to suck. I'm, not, I'm certainly not saying that it has to suck. So, uh, you know, in fact, you could take up that exact uh, condition as, you know, like when you make a mistake and life it takes something away from you, that's part of the damn adventure. There is no adventure without something at stake. You getting it? If there's nothing at stake, there's no adventure. Right? Like, if there's nothing sort of teetering in a dangerous balance, it may be whatever, a nice little time, but it's not an adventure. Part of what makes an adventure is you might win and you might lose. Well, uh, part of what makes uh, life an adventure is that, yeah, you'll, you'll lose. You'll lose some of the time. Some days you'll win, some days you'll lose. That's part of why it's an adventure. Without the sense of loss, without the sense of error, without the sense of, uh, uh, of deviation, you know, without the sense of things falling apart, there's no real adventure in human existence, you know. So uh, I think um, for me, and even if this answer doesn't work for you, but at least for me, this, this is a, a way of sort of bridging what might seem to be an, a, uh, you know, sort of a, a point of uh, divergence between uh, uh, existential hermeneutic type thinking and um, Buddhist meditative type thinking. It's like there's nothing wrong with passion, you know. <laughs> Um, I think from a, a Buddhist point of view, you know, like passion is just, it's sort of like in your meditation practice, like when you, when you find yourself in a very unmeditative state of consciousness, that becomes your practice. Okay, so when your mind is full of monkey mind, that's how they say it in Buddhist type language. In other words, it's like jumping around like a crazy little monkey when your mind is like that and you seem like, oh, I'm not doing meditation, I'm doing anti-meditation. The monkey mind becomes your practice. Okay, so it's not breathe in, breathe out anymore. It's like you just sort of recognize and observe your monkey mind. It's like, yeah. Or here's another thing that often happens, especially among beginners in meditation, is you get impatient with the meditation. It's like you get sort of antsy and like, when's this going to be done? And I wonder how much longer there is and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's your practice. That's your practice. So, you know, when you feel passion, that's your practice. Okay. It's all grist for the mill. I think both in Buddhist practice, but also uh, within, you know, the ambit of hermeneutics too. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the second video. I hope it uh, was an interesting one. It wasn't so much about, um, you know, sort of recapitulating some thinker. Uh, this is sort of more my own uh, mass of original insight. So I'll put my own picture on the thumbnail for this video. In any case, I hope you have a great day. Hope it's a wonderful one. You know, maybe uh, as the day is ending, uh, you might wonder about the impermanence of every day and ultimately of all of our days. Have a good one.